If you struggle to know exactly what you should be doing in a design studio, coming up with concepts, communicating your ideas, or just feeling really frustrated with the process, you're not alone. Over the last 10 years, I've taught hundreds, even thousands of architecture students and dozens of design studios. In many cases, as a student, you don't see the biggest issues stopping you doing better work because you're in your own little bubble. Today, I'm gonna run through the top seven issues I see as a tutor that are preventing architectural design students from thriving. Now, now some may or may not apply to you or the school of architecture that you're studying in might be doing something different. But by being aware of them, you can begin to take control of your education and learning process. You can fill the gaps with knowledge and make the changes to get you to where you need to go. So if that feels like something you need, then make sure you hit like and subscribe and stick around. The first issues is frameworks or lack of frameworks. One of the biggest gaps for architecture students, especially in design, are frameworks and guides which are like a set of rules or steps to help you get from A to B. So frameworks are like a support structure and a guide to underpin creativity. They're not a definitive set of rules or an answer but like prompts or questions or things to consider to help you think and get you to where you need to go and they're often missing. So let me explain what I mean by that. Big part of Design Studio includes design lectures. So you've shown examples of amazing architecture that relates to your studio project and great examples of drawings, models, and presentations. You're given a project brief or an assignment and you're told to go off and design a school, a housing development, an installation, whatever, but often, no one really breaks down the steps. No one tells you how to do a site analysis or how do you actually create a concept or approach space planning or that space planning is even a thing. Many students think the model or drawing or presentation graphic is the outcome, not the information in it. So they try and mimic these examples and graphic presentations versus the information and thinking and process that gets you to it. Often people are telling you what to do but not how or why to do it. So to me, it's kind of like going to a cooking class and being shown 10 different finished curry dishes and told to go and cook one. You have no idea what the ingredients are, how to prepare them or put them together and in what proportion, order or combination. You don't know what temperature to cook it on, whether it's on the top of the stove or in the oven. So architectural design studios and even other university subjects are often like that. You're shown the outcome and expected to figure it out, which is an important part of the process. But when students have never done this before and have no idea where to start or what to ask, it can leave you stuck for days or weeks or just going around and around in circles. Frameworks are a big part of my work and I'll be honest, a lot of creatives disagree with them. They think it's too restrictive that's fine. But it's like taking everything I know and breaking it into steps and ingredients and recipes for certain tasks and steps in the architectural project. You can start to look in frameworks and reverse engineer and break down the processes and thinking that different designers take to get from point A to point B. Now, as an architecture student, you need to be clear on the outcome you're being asked to create. If in doubt, ask, what am I supposed to be doing and how do I do it? And I'm going to be talking a lot more about frameworks in the future. The second issue is critical, conceptual and creative or design thinking. So to become a successful architect and designer requires different types of thinking at different times. You need critical, conceptual, creative, innovative, intuitive, logical, and design thinking. And some of these are really different. So you need to be able to put on different hats and see things from alternative perspectives at certain times. In architecture and design and most other creative pursuits, there often is no right or wrong answer. Sometimes there might be. And usually some answers and ideas are obviously better than others when you look at the pros and cons. And you can have multiple good creative solutions to a problem. Problem. The design process is all about identifying and testing different options and solutions. To be blunt, in many cases, the school system is letting you down. It's training you to take in information and regurgitate it to deliver an answer that is right or wrong. It's lacking in creativity or thinking outside the box. It's not teaching you to explore options, analyze, evaluate, or question. So then when you get to university, if you struggle with different thinking, you're not alone. As an architecture student, stop looking for the right answer or what the teacher wants and start to understand and practice different ways of thinking and how you can think more creatively or conceptually. The third issue is a focus on presentation over iterative process. Now, far too often I see students take a design studio brief and jump onto Illustrator or InDesign or Photoshop. It's 
the first thing they do. You begin to lay out final presentation panels or play on Photoshop to create a final finished drawing image or presentation panel. In a nutshell, student attention can often be focused too much on graphic presentations and making pretty presentation drawings. Now don't get me wrong, yes, graphics, drawing, communication and presentations are important. Very important. It's how you communicate your ideas. However, when the focus is all or mostly on graphics and presentation, the process of design development and iterations can be neglected. Design and creativity is not a linear process. Rarely do you do one perfect plan or one concept sketch and you're finished. It's also not just about producing an impressive drawing or a fly through. Design is an iterative process about testing ideas and getting the best solution possible. This means drawing, testing, obtaining feedback, getting it wrong, making mistakes, making changes, improving, getting it wrong again, and keeping on going. Not just completing a task or a drawing requirement once and you're done. Sorry, 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 sorry. But 80 to, sorry, 80 to 90% of your time should be focused on process, drawing, sketching, testing, making models, feedback, iterating. 10 to 20% of your time should be on final presentation drawings. And often it's the other way around. As an architecture student, an ordinary drawing of a well-tested and developed idea is way more valuable than a beautiful drawing of a superficial and untested idea that just doesn't work. The fourth issue is digital over analog. So following on from too much focus on presentation is too much focus on 3D and digital software as a design tool and the neglect of the analog and 2D. Now, as I said, I see a lot of students jump right into a 3D model in Revit or Rhino from day one. You start developing a plan and then just extrude the walls up or playing with random shapes and forms with no clear reason or intention and the rest of the time is spent dropping in random generic doors and windows. At the last minute you extract the plan section elevation, drop it into the presentation panels and put some pretty graphics on it. Now the foundational thinking, research, idea development, option testing and iterations is missing from that. And there's a number of big issues with this. One, students are trying to design in a 3D digital model rather than through 2D scale plan section and elevation. It's missing understanding of scale space and experience. Tutors cannot give valuable feedback when you're just zooming in and out of a model on a screen. We have no idea of what the spaces are doing until we see printed scale plans, sections and elevations. Final plan sections, elevations and details are underdeveloped and often incomplete or incorrect because they're printed at the last minute. So the content and conventions of these drawings need to be worked up individually and to scale, not relying on quick drawing extracts and a computer to get the conventions right because they mostly don't. So this topic deserves a full episode on its own. There's a lot to talk about here and I promise it's coming. But as an architecture student, get out of the 3D model, not all together, but regularly print out plans, sections and elevations of various scales. Test, revise, work them up with layers of butter, paper and pencils It'll and then take that information back into the model. It'll just give you a completely different perspective working at these different scales. Work it up in the model, print it out again, keep repeating. Fifth issue is productivity and time management. So when you're at school, you had bells and teachers telling you exactly what to do and when. University, you're pretty much left to manage yourself. It's adult learning. No one is making you be there. No one is forcing you to do the work. It can be super challenging to motivate and organize yourself and you are so not alone on this. I promise you. Productivity and time management are a skill. There's a lot to it. I've been practicing it for nearly 30 years. And unfortunately, no one is really teaching these skills to you, at least not in architecture school or to any of us really, or telling you exactly what you need to know. There are two main ways that students approach productivity and time management. There's students who are late, disorganized and inconsistent. You turn up without any work and spend the last week or two of semester doing all nighters and running yourself ragged to get it all done to varying standards. And this, well, it creates a lot of stress. Then there's students who seem to be working all the time. However, your outcomes and work don't reflect the amount of time spent because the time you spend is not efficient or effective. You sit down and play around without a clear focus on what you want to produce or a clear process on how to do this. And when you had a lot of time to do something, you tend to fill it and stretch it out and become distracted. 10 hours pottering in a 3D model or playing with Photoshop filters is not necessarily efficient or effective work. So as an architecture student, commit to developing productivity as a skill. Study it, Implement new ways of working and constantly reflect on what is and isn't working and where you can improve. And then do it. 
The sixth issue is capability, repetition, and consistency. So following on from productivity and time management is the challenge of capability and consistency. Capability is your ability to complete any task you're given. It's the level of skill you have in many different things, such as drawing, creative thinking, communication, productivity, or time management. Everyone comes to university with different skills and capabilities. Some of you might have spent years in art or graphics classes or just have a natural ability to draw and others may struggle. So you might pick up software quickly or slowly. Some might develop conceptual ideas and thinking. Others may take years to really understand this. That was me. Some of you have strengths in one area, others in a different area. It doesn't matter. You're only at the start of your design journey, even if you're near the end of your degree and you can improve. One of the big challenges students face around capability is the expectation to be good the first time and get the right answer, to do one plan and be finished, to create one 3D model and be praised and told it's amazing. Design is one of those things that never really feels finished. There's always something to be improved at every level, even in practice. There's a reason most most architects become famous in their 40s, 50s or 60s because it takes time to get good at this stuff. Now regardless of where you are, two of the most important things that will move you forward are repetition and consistency. If you want to be better at drawing or sketching, do 200 terrible sketches. Repeat the process. Don't just get disheartened after one. I guarantee by the 10th sketch you'll be better already. And then learn to be consistent. If 12 week semester requires 20 hours of work a week, you can't do 240 hours of high quality work and 10 all nighters in the last two weeks. But imagine the difference of three or four really focused hours a day over those 12 weeks. You can produce a way higher standard of work and have a life at the same time. As an architecture student, commit to working consistently from day one. Set a plan in place and accountability if you need it. When faced with a new task or skill and something you've never done before, lower your expectations. Be okay with making mistakes and commit to repeating the process and learning. The seventh issue is passion and excitement. So one of the final issues students face is finding passion and excitement for architecture and design. Sounds strange, but let me explain. If you struggle to stay interested and inspired for the long term, consider what draws you to architecture. Is it the graphics and drawings and presentations or building, making stuff, being on site? Do you hate being in front of a computer but love buildings? Do you like working with people? Maybe you'd be better in a graphic design or a building trade. Only you can figure that out. Architecture can be a path to many things and it may not be exactly the path you need to take. You might need to pivot into a slightly dis different discipline or you might not like all parts of architecture but you ha just haven't found your place yet which is totally okay. Whatever you're doing might just be something to help you get off the wrong track and onto the right one either within architecture or a slightly different related discipline. Now even if you love it you may be presented with a project that is very unfamiliar to you. You have no real understanding of an office space, a museum or a kindergarten. You haven't been in one for 20 years. You just might not be that excited about the site or the brief or the style of lecturing and content just might not work for you. Totally cool. It happens. Not everything is going to be amazing and aligned. So find the part of the projects and lectures that interest and excite you and dig into them. Double down. Or consider parts of architecture that have interested you previously in past subjects and studios. And can you find a new perspective to bring in and apply to this project or subject, looking at it from a different way? How can you drive your own passion rather than waiting for someone else to give it to you? Research, explore, and give your own spin to the project. Now, even if it's not exactly what was asked for, most teachers value an excited student outside the box rather than a disengaged student trying to follow the rules and do something that doesn't excite them. Finally, students often get to the end of a project or semester and begin to lose interest and momentum. This is common at all stages of your career. What once seems exciting and new after weeks and months of just being in it, you now can't wait to be rid of it. So for this, you have have to find a way to reignite your spark or shift perspectives and keep growing or take a little break and do something else and come back to it. This is another skill to master. Consistency from the start can help stop this burning out at the end. So as an architecture student, find what excites and interests you and keep coming back to that. There's a lot of challenges students face, I know. I could give you a list of 200 rather than just seven, but on a quick reflection after being away from creating this content for so long, these are some of the biggest, most common and most repeating and impactful challenges I can see, I'm seeing. 
Being aware of these challenges can definitely help you see what's happening and start to look for ways to change and improve. So if you've faced any of these issues or this content is making sense to you, then make sure you hit like and subscribe. There'll be a lot more of it. In the meantime, I hope this has been helpful. Here's some other episodes that might be of help popping up on the screen or in the description. Thanks for watching this episode. I will see you in the next one.